you guys are easy. <laughs> All right, we're off to a good start. I found the marker. Um, and uh, I'm actually a bit lucky to be here um, because, uh, not for lack of being able to find my way, uh, but for some problems I encountered at Mumbai Airport with immigration. Um, I've been through, oh, half a dozen or so airports in the last four or five days. I came from Los Angeles through Chicago to Amsterdam for one day. I had a 20-minute presentation there. And then um, from Amsterdam through London Heathrow to Mumbai. Mumbai Airport was actually the easiest. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> now, I, I typically navigate airports on my own. Uh, my policy is I book assistance. There's a little thing on the ticket saying uh, request for assistance. About half the time, assistance doesn't show up. <laughs> okay. And uh, my policy is if the assistance does show up and they're pleasant and friendly, why not go with assistance? If the assistant doesn't show up or isn't pleasant or friendly, I go alone, which I did through Mumbai. Okay. And did fine. I made it through uh, customs. I made it through all of the things that we're supposed to make it through until I was stopped by an immigration officer. He singled me out of a crowd of people moving toward the luggage area. I didn't have luggage. I carried all of my bags. And uh, he wouldn't let me go further unless I could show him a letter of reference from my caregiver. Who is responsible for taking care of me? OK. He said, you cannot walk the streets alone in India without someone to take care of you. Now, I had a feeling that this gentleman could pretty much make up the rules as he went along. <laughs> so how exactly does one play this? Because all of my documentation was in order, OK? I've been to India before on the same visa. I filled out my customs card the same way. I had no letter from a caregiver. I'm 46 years old. I haven't had a caregiver since I was 18. So I said to him firmly, but politely, with a smile, I said, I travel alone. He could see from my passport that um, I've been to, oh, nearly 30 countries. In fact, this is actually my second book. And he could see that I was indeed traveling alone, which was the problem he was having in the first place. <laughs> he was so shocked, he stepped aside without another word. That's why I'm here. Okay. <laughs> So how, why am I actually here, OK? Why am I standing on a TEDx stage all the way from the US? We've seen prodigies. We've seen uh, <laughs> world-class scientists, world-class entertainers. We've seen people who are movers and shakers of the known universe. Why me? And I'm actually kind of wondering the same thing. Um, but I can tell you that I am known the world over, dozens, literally, dozens of countries, dozens and dozens of countries, uh, for my very special tongue click. Here it goes. And that about says it all, really. Thank you very much. Um, well, there is a little more. There's a little more. Um, many people, most people, I would say, regard blindness as a, uh, a devastating disruption to life and livelihood, as a tragedy, as a sad shame. And indeed, blind people all over the world um, are restricted. They are not 
allowed freedom, they are not supported to be free. Case in point, Mumbai Airport. Okay. If I did not have the ability to, in fact, navigate Mumbai Airport, and if I did not have the strength of character to face down an official, politely, with a smile, um, I might still be there. <laughs> um, so this is really uh, an epidemic among blind individuals. Okay? Now, what we'll learn from this talk is that it really affects more than just blind individuals. It affects blind individuals. It affects everyone they influence, everyone we influence, our families, our friends, uh, everyone listening to this TEDx talk, potentially. Um, so it's a widespread issue. Um, the question that I'll give out to you is then, why the click? Why the cane? Okay. What is the purpose? What is the reason? What does it mean? So I'm going to ask everyone to close your eyes for just a moment. <clears throat> Humor me. Close your eyes, everyone. And imagine that you go to open your eyes. Don't open them, please. Imagine that you go to open your eyes, but they, they don't open. OK? They just don't open. My eyes were removed when I was an infant from retinoblastoma. I lost the first at seven months of age, the second at 13 months of age. Effectively, my eyes don't open. The eyes of 40 million blind people worldwide don't open. What are you going to do? Keep your eyes closed. What are you going to do? Eventually, you'll have to do something. Life and livelihood continue to beckon you for your participation. The world continues to turn. Eventually, you're going to have to move. You're going to have to get up out of your chair and go somewhere, do something. So many of you might be thinking, well, I'll just grab onto someone. Sure. How realistic is that? Try to imagine every movement of your existence predicated upon someone else, someone to direct you, someone to show you where to go and tell you what to do. Okay. If you grab onto someone, you might just not let go. And what happens to your life? Now, <clears throat> with your eyes still closed, continue to imagine that uh, somehow, in your flailing about wondering what to do next, you find a stick. It's a stick, like mine, and it comes up to, oh, let's just say your chin. Now, just imagine, you now have a stick. You have received no training. But is there at all a sense of greater confidence now in your ability to at least get up and begin to move around? Yes or no? Sure. Sure there is. Common sense tells us that. OK. <clears throat> now you can open your eyes. With that stick, you haven't even learned to click, OK? But with that stick, despite your blindness, you have just taken your first steps toward freedom, OK? Let's find out what happens when we uh, are able to activate all of the non-visual senses, when we're able to open them through a lifetime of self-directed action and experience. It's like if you guys can see with your eyes, and we um, can see with our ears.
riding a mountain bike, playing soccer, or skateboarding may seem like a breeze to most people unless you see what they see. It's gradually going taller. Yes. And then goes across. Yep. And then it's gradually coming back down again. Yes. That's amazing. It, I can like see the car. You can see it in your mind. Holy mother. <laughs> <laughs> able to identify where the things are and what are what are the clues to go anywhere in this world. When he woke up from the surgery and he said, Mom, I can't see anymore, I can't see anymore. And I told him, I said, baby, yes, you can see. I said, you can see with your hands. And I put his little hands on my face. I said, see me? And I said, you can see me with your nose. And I put my hand to his nose and I said, you smell me? I said, you can see me with your ears. I said, you hear me? I said, baby, you can't use your eyes anymore, but you still have your hands and your nose and your ears. I said, baby, you can still see. The first session, the first lesson, or one of the first lessons I did with Juan Ruiz, the little boy at the beginning, um, was to climb a tree with him. He was 12 years old, and we were, oh, about 12 meters in the air, okay? Reaching for the sky. We help students reach for the sky. We help blind people to find freedom by a different way of seeing. We regard blindness as nothing more than a circumstance, a challenging circumstance requiring adaptation. And we have the neurology to adapt. I'll get to that in a little while. Um, so let me just give you a, a, a demonstration of how this adaptation process works and can work very quickly. Um, close your eyes again, please. I'm going to turn my back to the audience, just because. Um, it's a habit thing for this particular exercise. Now, with your eyes closed, I'm going to teach you all to ride a bicycle. Pay close attention, there will be a quiz. Okay? So, I'm going to make a sound. It's just going to be a sound. It doesn't change, it stays the same. What is going to change, though, is this panel that I'm going to move toward and away from my face. And listen to what happens when the panel moves. Could you hear that? You can hear the panel move. Keep your eyes closed, please, because now comes the quiz. I told you there would be a quiz. Okay, so now what I'd like you to do is to say now when you hear the panel start to move. So there will be a period of shushing with no change, but when you hear the panel start to move, go ahead and say now. Let's relax into this, let's not jump the gun, okay? Oh, good. I didn't have to hit myself in the face with it. Okay, go ahead and open your eyes. So you went from here to about here. Okay, so oh, centimeters, help me. Here, here. We're Americans, we can't help it. About um, 20 centimeters, perhaps. Okay, or maybe 30, between 20 and 30 centimeters. So that's the idea. It's that simple. We train the brain to access the visual centers through reflected sound instead of reflected light. The brain can do this. In fact, the brain can do this quite quickly and easily, as you've just seen, with no training whatsoever. Okay? Um, 
the science behind this is very simple. It's simple brain science. We, uh, when, when, you, when you support individuals who are blind into self-directed movement, the ability to move around their environment, uh, the brain is like a muscle. You develop and improve and strengthen what you use. What does not get used atrophies. Most blind people are not allowed self-directed movement. Their movements are determined and governed by others. Okay? Their actions, their activities, and uh, how they conduct their lives are often determined by others. In order to have freedom of movement, you have to have the brain mechanisms that support freedom of movement. If you haven't had freedom of movement, you haven't developed those brain mechanisms. So we sort of um, reinstate or reestablish the mechanisms behind freedom of movement. Let's see what happens when I hit the clicker. A number of research projects have shown that people who are blind um, are in some ways redeploying uh, the visual brain um, in such a way that they are truly seeing and appreciating the world around them and that that visual brain does light up um, even though it's never received a visual input. So in many ways, uh, this fantastic additional computing power of the brain, which is used for vision, is being redeployed as a way of seeing the world um, in the mind's eye. What this tells us is a number of things. We can use uh, parts of the brain that are normally devoted to vision uh, to process auditory information uh, when visual information is removed. For me personally, this has been a really great experience because I've been working on the echolocation of bats uh, and we've only recently started working on echolocation with humans. Now having Daniel here around is like almost being able to talk to a bat. And Daniel is not only an exceptionally good at echolocation, he's also exceptionally good at verbalizing how he does it. How does this translate into action? How does this translate into life and livelihood? I'll just give one example. Let's go back to little Juan Ruiz, little 12-year-old Juan Ruiz, okay, who learned to climb a tree, who learned to echolocate. He walked himself to the park. He found his own tree, okay, which I would say most blind children do not have the opportunity to do. There's immense social pressure against freedom of movement for blind individuals, okay? Well, now Juan is 30 years old. He works for us as an instructor, and he travels about as much as I do around the world. We have several instructors, all blind, teaching blind individuals how to find freedom in their lives. Um, let's just take a quick look at one of Juan's exploits. Signore, dalla California, Juan Ruiz! Eccomi, eccomi. Sono qua, Juan. Welcome, buongiorno, welcome. Buongiorno. Gracias, thank you. This obstacle course here that I'm going to do today is not just poles. Okay, start at my go. Three, two, one, go. It is a goal. And the bigger the goal, the more obstacles you face. And on the other side of that goal is victory. Un Guinness World Record. Stop. E allora! E allora! E allora! Now, Juan did not have a chance to practice that obstacle course. And it's not everyone who is actually invited by Guinness to come and set a record. And while he was in Italy, he worked with other families of blind children there. Our work faces, uh, well, our work is, is, is greatly supported by, by deep pockets of support in various places. It's one of the reasons I'm here in India, and I have a, a two-week tour once I leave here. But our work is also faced with much uh, controversy and skepticism, because what we do is believed to be impossible. What we do is believed to be impossible, and furthermore, the teaching of it is believed to be impossible. We believe that the im in impossible stands for 
make it possible. Okay? Make it possible. But even that isn't the message. Even that isn't the most important thing to us. The most important thing to us is what Juan had to say after he set his record, the last video. Yes, you si can. Yes, si you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Ci rivediamo qui, tra poco, allo show dei record. This is open to us all, okay? Blindness is defined as lack of awareness. We're not just talking about physical blindness. We're not just talking about whether or not the eyes work. We're talking about a state of mind a frame of mind. What we hope is to help everyone see more clearly to greater freedom. We think... <laughs> we think that blind individuals learning literally to see can serve as an illustrative example to everyone that we all have, we all are faced, are challenged by blindness in our lives. Psychological blindness, social blindness, spiritual blindness. And we think that the most debilitating, the most dangerous form of blindness is blindness to our own blindness. So it isn't about, it isn't about what Juan can do, it isn't about what I can do. It's about what we all can do. Yes, you can. Yes, we can. Let's all reflect, recognize our blindness, learn to see through our blindness to a world beyond that we have found has much greater luster and richness and potential for freedom of achievement than any of us could have otherwise imagined. Thanks for having me.